Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about an anatomical feature that's unique to the lower cervical spine, and that's what's called the uncovertebral joints, or UV joints as they're often abbreviated. So when we talk about the cervical spine, it's divided into two regions. The top region is relatively short. It really just consists of the atlanoaxial and atlanooccipital joints. Recall the atlanooccipital joint is the joint between the atlas, which is C1, and the skull. Whereas the atlanoaxial joint is the joint between the atlas and the axis, C1 and C2. So it's really just the joint between C1 and the skull, and then the C1, C2 joint. That's the upper cervical spine, also called the craniovertebral joints. When we get beneath that, starting at the C2, C3 joint, all the way down through the cervical spine, that longer segment is called the lower cervical spine. Okay, so the lower cervical spine is actually longer than the upper cervical spine. And so this uncovertebral joint is something we're only going to see in the lower cervical spine. We won't see it in the thoracic or lumbar or the upper cervical spine. So before we get into what the uncovertebral joint is and what its significance is, let's actually do a very brief review of some major structures here in the vertebrae. Now, these are not cervical vertebrae by any means, but some of the features here we do need to discuss. We're obviously going to have vertebral bodies right here. Between these two vertebral bodies, we have the intervertebral disc. And recall that this is loosely divided into two regions. The external region is called the annulus fibrosus, or sometimes just called annulus. And the central region is defined as the nucleus pulposus. We also have a zygopophyseal joint right here. This is also called a facet or facet joint, and it exists between the inferior articular process of the vertebra above and the superior articular process of the vertebra below. And there's a zygopophyseal joint on each side, left and right. And recall that the zygopophyseal joint is a synovial joint. It has a synovial membrane lined with synovial fluid and a fibrous capsule. Now, in contrast, we're going to see that the uncovertebral joint is not a synovial joint. In fact, some sources will not refer to it as a true joint at all. But it is important for some of the mobility aspects of the cervical spine. So, here's some other pictures that we have here. So these are actually cervical vertebrae, right? And of course, we're looking at a superior view here. This is the vertebral body, okay? On top of this, we would actually see the intervertebral discs. What's important to note here is actually flanking the body laterally on either side, we have these elevated regions called the unconate processes. So first begin by looking at the medial aspect of the vertebral body. As you go laterally on either side, it appears to rise up and sort of terminate right here with these vampire teeth looking structures. These are the unconate processes. We have an unconate process on the patient's left over here and one on the patient's right in cervical vertebrae C3 through C7. These unconate processes do not exist in C1 or C2. These unconate processes will grow from loose vascular fibrous tissue lateral to the annulus fibrosus of the disc. And by about seven to eight years of age, the unconate processes have grown enough to form a type of joint. They call it an adventitious joint, but it is certainly not a synovial joint. So you can see here two vertebrae stacked on top of one another. On the lower vertebra, we can see the unconate process on the, on the patient's left and the unconate process on the patient's right. And we see that these unconate processes have extended upwards and they can more or less articulate with the inferior part of the vertebral body above on either side. This is called the lushka joint or joint alushka, also called the uncovertebral or UV joint. And what's important to know is that this uncovertebral joint or joint of Lushka is actually lined by a thin layer of fibrocartilage. So it is not hyaline cartilage as you'd see in most articulating surfaces. And this fibrocartilage is likely derived from the annulus fibrosus of the nearby intervertebral disc. On this slide, we have some x-rays here showing some of the uncovertebral joints. So right here, this is C1, C2, C3, and C4. Notice C3 is the first vertebra that actually has these unconate processes. C1 and C2 do not. 
In any case, here's the unconate process of C4, one of them. This is actually on the patient's right side. And you can see here that it flanks the intervertebral disc on either side. Here's the left unconate process. And so this right here would be the uncovertebral joint. A couple other things about the uncovertebral joint. Again, it's not a synovial joint. It does not have a true synovial joint capsule, and it does not have synovial fluid. It is bathed in a kind of interstitial fluid, but it is not a synovial joint. Now, the uncovertebral joint, together with the zygopophyseal joints, do add some stability to the cervical spine. However, the zygopophyseal joints contribute far more to the overall stability than do the uncovertebral joints. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, functionally, the most important thing about these unconate processes is as they grow, they start to create horizontal fissures in the intervertebral discs. So for example, in the intervertebral disc between C3 and C4, we would start to see fissuring in this disc horizontally from the edges, okay? From the parts of the disc that are more or less in contact with the unconate processes. This fissuring we do not see in the C1, C2 intervertebral disc. This is only seen starting in the C2, C3 intervertebral disc because the C3 vertebra is the first one that has these unconate processes. If you look at this x-ray down here, you can actually see the beginnings of this horizontal fissure. And this is occurring where we have the unconate process. So actually this bulge of the bone below, right here, this is actually the unconate process. And we actually see this fissuring beginning right here on the lateral aspect of the intervertebral disc, closest to that unconate process. And as we age, we get older and older, this fissure is going to extend farther and farther until it pretty much encompasses the entire disc with the possible exception of the anterior annulus fibrosis. Now, contrary to what logic might dictate, this horizontal fissuring triggered by the growth of the unconate process here in the intervertebral disc is actually a normal physiological process. It's not painful. And the reason why it's important is as this fissuring continues, it's essentially going to divide this intervertebral disc into a superior half and an inferior half. Now, this fissuring does not completely separate the two discs. It's not like you took a sword and cut it in half. Okay? They're still connected to one another, but it's a loose connection. They're sort of semi-separated. And what this allows is the formation of what's called a bipartite disc. Bipartite means like two leaves. And so you have one leaf on top, one leaf on bottom. And so what can essentially happen is if they're not completely intact, if they're semi-separated, then the part of the disc on top, the superior part, can sort of glide on top of the inferior part. So in other words, this top part can move anteriorly over the inferior part of the disc, or this top part can move posteriorly over the inferior part of the disc. So it allows some gliding movements, okay, which is very important to the mobility of the cervical spine. Recall that the cervical spine has more mobility than any other part of the spine, including the lumbar spine. Let's get a feel for that. And so what we're going to do is assume this person's going to go into full cervical flexion, so flexion of the neck, right? And full cervical flexion, we're talking approximately 45 to 50 degrees range of motion. Now, now remember what this bipartite disc allows. Because the superior part of the disc is semi-separated from the inferior part, the superior part can actually translate a little bit on the inferior surface. Okay? So when we go into flexion, we get something called upsloping. Okay? We get something called upsloping. So when this person goes into flexion of the neck, as you see here, what happens is the vertebra above will actually slide anteriorly relative to the vertebra below. So when we consider the C2 vertebra right here during flexion, it will actually slide a little bit anteriorly relative to C3. We can say the same thing about C3. Relative to C4, C3 will slide a little bit anteriorly relative to C4. And this pretty much continues all throughout the cervical spine. Okay? And we don't have this between C7 and T1. The last part of it's only between C6 and C7. 
And this process of these vertebra moving anteriorly relative to the vertebra below, that's called upsloping. And we also see two other things in upsloping. One is because these cervical vertebra are translating forward relative to the vertebra below, we actually see the annulus fibrosus slightly compressed. Now that might seem bad, but what we also see is that the zygopophyseal joint posteriorly actually has some stress taken off of it. Okay? In other words, the two articulating surfaces of the zygopophyseal joint, they actually come apart a little bit. So it actually relieves some of that stress or decompresses the zygopophyseal joint. Okay? To put this in perspective, if we look at a bipartite disc like this in neutral neck position, so standing upright, the superior part of the disc and inferior part are really just on top of one another like this, like we would expect in any other part of the spine, more or less. But during flexion, the superior part of the disc actually moves a little bit anteriorly relative to the inferior part of the disc below. Okay? And it's not a huge movement, it's only a couple millimeters, so it's a very small movement. But since we have this movement all throughout the cervical spine for the most part, with the exception of the C1, C2 joint, uh, it's going to increase the range of motion of the neck in both flexion and extension. Let's actually look and see what happens during extension. So this person is performing a full extension of the neck, approximately 85 degrees range of motion. But instead of upsloping, what we instead see is something called downsloping, which is pretty much the opposite. So back to this picture, if we go from a neutral position to extension, instead what we actually see is the superior part of the disc actually translates posteriorly relative to the inferior part of the disc below. Okay. And so what we see here in downsloping is, yes, the vertebra above is going to slide a little bit posteriorly relative to the vertebra below. So just as an example, if we're considering C4, C5, during downsloping, which occurs during extension, the C4 vertebra would slide posteriorly relative to C5. And again, this pattern continues pretty much throughout the cervical spine with the exception of the C1, C2 joint. Okay? A couple other things happen opposite of what we see during flexion. Okay? In the case of the annulus fibrosus, it's decompressed because we're taking that stress off of it. If we were flexing forward, we'd be compressing the annulus fibrosus anteriorly. But since we're extending backward, we're relieving that stress off of the anterior annulus fibrosus. Conversely, in downsloping, the zygopophyseal joint gets some extra stress. Okay? Uh, so those articulating surfaces of the zygopophyseal joints actually come closer together. Okay? So really with upsloping and downsloping, we can actually alter the distance between the articulating surfaces in the zygopophyseal joint. This is not something that we normally see in other regions of the spine. And the major reason we're able to see that is because of this bipartite disc formation, which occurs because of these unconate processes and overall the uncovertebral joints. A couple other aspects that I want to talk about are lateral flexion, like you see here, and then also rotation of the neck. So here's lateral flexion. This person is laterally flexing their neck to the right. Now, I think if we think about this lateral flexion relative to neutral, it would make sense. The left side here has to elongate, right? Whereas the right side here actually has to compress. It decreases in length. So if I asked you which side is undergoing upslope and which side is undergoing downsloping, well, the patient's left side would have to be undergoing upsloping. Because if we're to elongate this side of the neck, that implies that the zygopophyseal joints are going to have to become more distant from one another, meaning the articulating surfaces are going to have to actually become a little bit further apart okay, in order to elongate this side of the neck. That's upsloping. And also, like with upsloping, what we would also see is that there's a little bit, a tiny amount of rotation. And so what we would see is that during that upslope, just like during flexion, we would also see that the vertebra above is going to translate a little bit anteriorly relative to the vertebra below, but only on the left side. We're going to see the opposite on the right. We're going to see downsloping because this side actually has to compress, become shorter. 
So the, the right side is going to downslope, meaning in terms of the zygopophyseal joints, the articulating surfaces get closer together. And just like we saw before in downsloping, we would also see the vertebra above translate a little bit posteriorly relative to the vertebra below, but only on the right side. So we see upsloping on the left, downsloping on the right, and that's if we laterally flex to the right. If we laterally flex the other way, it would just flip. Okay. So here's an interesting thing about cervical rotation. Notice when this patient rotates her head to the right, there's actually a little bit of lateral flexion of the spine to the right as well. In fact, if you try to rotate your head any direction, you cannot avoid lateral flexion in the same direction. And so when this person rotates their head to the right, we're going to see a similar pattern in the cervical spine. We're going to see upsloping on the left side and downsloping a little bit on the right side. Okay? So in this, we're going to see three things here on the left because we're upsloping. One, we're going to have in the zygopophyseal joints, the articulating surfaces get a little bit further apart. Number two, the anterior annulus fibrosus is going to be a little bit compressed. And then number three on the left side, we're going to see a little bit of anterior translation of the vertebra above relative to the vertebra below. Conversely, on the right side, we're going to see the opposites because there's a little bit of downslope here on the right. So again, three things. One, on the right side, the zygopophyseal joints are going to have to come a little bit closer together, so the articulating surfaces will actually decrease in their distance apart. A little bit of compression on the zygopophyseal joint. Number two, the anterior annulus fibrosis will be decompressed. And then number three, we'll see posterior translation of the vertebra above, relative to the vertebra below. And so really, if you had to summarize this upsloping and downsloping, really with upsloping, you're seeing anterior translation of the vertebra above relative to the vertebra below. With downsloping, you're seeing tra posterior translation of the vertebra above relative to the vertebra below, okay? And also with uh, upsloping, which we see in flexion, okay, upsloping would also involve a little bit of compression of the anterior annulus fibrosis, but you're making those articulating surfaces, the zygopossial joint, further apart, just a little bit. Whereas with downsloping, which we see in extension, that is actually taking a little bit of stress off of the anterior annulus fibrosis. The zygopophyseal joints are going to have to come a little bit closer together, okay, meaning the articulating surfaces come a little bit closer together, but you're also seeing that posterior translation of the vertebra above relative to the vertebra below. And these gliding motions that we see between the various vertebrae are only possible because we have this bipartite disc where they are semi-separated from one another. So hopefully this video made sense and gave you some good information about the oncovertebral joints. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.